And so now I'm really excited to introduce uh, two amazing women who will share their talents and perspectives with us as part of the 2020 Gap Year Association keynote presentation. Uh, before I introduce our keynote speaker, Angelo, Angelou Ezilo, uh, I'm thrilled to share that Marsha Dunn um, has volunteered her skills as a graphic facilitator to help us visualize and process Angelou's uh, keynote presentation. Um, and as an artist myself, I'm really looking forward to seeing how Marsha uh, works to create visuals to promote collaboration, deepen understanding and retention, and engage audiences. Um, much of Marsha's work uh, centers on the art of listening and creating live illustrations of discussions and presentations. Marsha has worked with uh, organizations ranging from Fortune 100 companies and global foundations to academic institutions and local nonprofits. Uh, and it looks like she's got a bit of a teaser here for you. So she's going to be mapping uh, and interpreting Angelou's um, keynote for us here. Uh, also worth noting that Marsha is the director of the Visual Thought Lab at Seguinland Institute, which is currently running the Good Life Gap. Uh, semester program on the coast of Maine, where Marsha lives. Um, and Ethan, I don't know if you want to pull up Angelou's slide. Great. Um, so now I'm um, thrilled uh, as a presenting sponsor and also GYA board member, really honored to welcome Angelou uh, Ezlo as our 2020 Gap Year Association keynote speaker. Angelou is the CEO and co-founder of Greening Youth Foundation, a nonprofit organization with a mission to engage underrepresented youth and young adults while connecting them with the outdoors and careers in conservation. She is a 2016 Ashoka Fellow and a graduate of Spelman College and the University of Florida College of Law. In addition to her work through Greening Youth Foundation, she has shared both her personal uh, story and professional experiences through the co-authored book, Engage, Protect, uh, Connect, Protect, um, which I would highly recommend. Um, on behalf of the association and the GYA Board of Directors, we are so grateful for the opportunity to work with Angelou on her and her team. Um, I was fortunate to catch some of uh, um, the North Carolina Conservation Network's virtual panel discussion last month. Um, and it was so inspiring to see such strong participation and active engagement from the young people who joined the conversation led by Angelou. So uh, very, very uh, lucky to have her with us uh, today. And in particular, given GYA's continued interest in engaging students, increasing equity and access, and addressing these existential threats of climate change, um, we have a lot to learn from our keynote speaker. Um, so thank you for joining us today, and I'm very excited to have you. Angelou, uh, are you ready? Oh, that was my, my cue to start. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Aliyah. And thank you to um, the Gap Year Association community. Um, but I'd also like to thank Ethan Knight there, um, Diana Hahn, and uh, Marsha Dunn. Um, I'm super excited about that. I'm hoping that I'm not going to just stop and start like looking at the screen and not talk. <laughs> Junior Rogers, um, as well as Aaliyah, and go overseas. And I really appreciate you all, you know, bringing me to, to this conference. I'm really excited about it. Yes, yeah, so as Aaliyah said, my name is Angelou Ezilo. I am the CEO of Greening Youth Foundation, and I'm also the co-author of Engage, Connect, Protect. Um, but that's really just a sliver of who I am. I am a wife to an amazing, amazing husband of 25 years. I am a mom to two um, really, really cool sons <laughs> and um, daughter to, to, to parents that I couldn't have you know, created better parents. And they've been also married for 60 plus years. A sister to you know, a brother and an older sister and just friends, having gone to Spelman, just have a community of women you know, that I'm really cool friends with. And I like to call myself a change maker. 
um, somewhat of a disruptor. <laughs> so I want to um, just start with two quotes to kind of frame my discussion. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of Dr. Wangari Mathai. She's the, the first African woman to receive a Nobel Peace Prize for her work in sustainable agriculture. Um, she's no longer with, her, with us from Kenya. She's known for her work with the Green Belt Movement, um, but also wrote an incredible book called Unbowed. I, I actually had the pleasure of meeting her. But one quote that she's, all, she's also always known for saying is, there are opportunities even in the most difficult times. And I just think that that is really important for us. Um, and I think Aaliyah, you mentioned it, but just for us to understand the moment of now. Um, and the other quote that I would like to share is by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. So I can't even, you know, as we're all saying, we are in the midst of so many crises, a public health crisis, a racial and social justice crises, a climate crisis, and to add to that, an election and a racially charged election, um, that's in a week. So that makes this moment more urgent than ever. And I don't know about you, but it, it's just creating so much anxiety and all of the feelings, you know? So what I wanna do today is just share a little bit more about myself. Um, and then I wanna make the case for why we need all of you out there in the GYA, GYA community working to effectuate change. But not just like on a local level, a statewide level, a national level, but also on a global level. And I saw in the chat, we are joined today by people from all over the world. So it's really a pleasure to deliver this message to you all, but we need change in all systems, not just in education, health system and the environment, but all systems. So who am I? I grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey. So if I were there with you all, I would ask for my Jersey folks to raise their hands. So maybe in the chat, you can kind of let me know how many of you even like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I'm seeing some Jersey folks in the chat. Um, but yeah, so grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey with my parents and two siblings and my grandmother um, lived with us. And my grandmother was actually the one that first introduced me to nature, the beauty of nature. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar, but there are these brownstones in Jersey City. So we just really had this small four by six garden that was in front of our brownstone, but it was filled with these beautiful um, plants and flowers that my grandmother used to kind of nurture. And she actually had me there as her, de her deputy. So, you know, I really, I, there was this one plant that I remember in particular called the four o'clock plant that was amazing because every day at four o'clock it would bloom. Um, but so I was, she shared all this with me. She also grew um, vegetables and so forth in the backyard. So it was, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing more people with their New Jersey shout outs. Thanks guys. Um, but then, you know, it wasn't just that exposure to nature at, in our brownstones in Jersey City. My parents owned 54 acres of land in upstate New York, in Sion, New York. So every summer, um, they would take my siblings and I to upstate New York. And that's really where I think the magic happened for me because we had like this small, humble home, but like all of these acres of forested land that we would take these incredible hikes on, um, pick berries. I had like all these like cool critters that I befriended and had names for them. And I'm sure a lot of you might have these same stories. But, you know, at that time, Although I exhibited so much love for the outdoors and, and nature, that, ne that wasn't necessarily the route that, you know, my parents had um, kind of encouraged me to pursue. I don't know, maybe it's, it's like a, a, we came from a black middle class family, and perhaps that was a field that they weren't really familiar with. So, you know, we 
that we were encouraged to do kind of like the, the lawyer, doctor, you know, engineer, architect, that kind of route. Um, I went on to Spelman College, which was really um, special for me, a, a HBCU, all women's college. Um, and then after that, I mean, that was a really important, important step for me because up to then, I kind of thought that I wanted to be this, you know, celebrity, this star, you know, because I actually had a dancing background, singing, all this kind of stuff. Clearly, you guys, that didn't work out for me because you guys don't really know this space. It's the first time you've probably all seen me. I did have like a little 15 second of fame in the movie Do the Right Thing. So you'll have to watch that movie again and freeze it, put it on pause, like when they're going through the water scene. Um, so that's kind of my moments of fame. But I left Spelman um, with this incredible sense of sisterhood and community. Um, but I went on to law school and, you know, because I really was wanting to work on change and, and finding, trying to figure out what that might look like for me in my very young life. But I met my husband there of 25 years, so it wasn't all for loss. <laughs> no slight to the lawyers out there, but um, it just didn't resonate with me. I went on to become a corporate attorney, um, but I, as I said, it didn't, you know, on Sunday Sundays when I had to think about where I was going the next day, I would get that pit in my stomach and I knew that that was probably in part because what I was doing was not what my passion, my mission was. Um, so I went on to do work in land conservation, working for the Department of Agriculture, doing farmland preservation, and then trust for public land, doing land conservation as a project manager for them. Um, and this was getting closer to what I felt resonated with me because I was like, all of a sudden there are careers in the environmental field um, that I could perhaps pursue and I didn't even know anything about. But the thing was, I was so lonely doing this work because there was there were so few people that looked like me. There were no mentors, you know, there were there wasn't a pipeline. Um, so and I knew this was very strange to me because I knew that growing up in a very Afrocentric family, I knew the connections of people of color to the environment. So it was just really weird to me. And also at this time is when I was feeling this real acute feeling of inequity in the environmental field. So I started looking, you know, I realized that, you know, what's, what's guiding this? Why are we at this point? And I started realizing that marketing was playing a big point and it still is. When you look at images of people in the outdoors, whether it's working or um, recreating in the outdoors, you very rarely see people of color doing these things. You, you know, you might see uh, a, a, a white man with a beard. I'm sorry, Luke, I'm not picking on you. <laughs> but, I, but, you know, with a flannel shirt, looking out at a vista, you know, a beautiful vista. So you start to think, associate different looks and different people with the outdoors. And it's something that I call like this e eternal stereotype. Um, because it started in my spaces where I was working in the environmental field, there was this notion of, well, people of color don't, they're not necessarily interested in the environment. You know, I would hear that in a lot of different places. And I'm like, that is absolutely untrue. But why are we getting to this place? So I realized that it has a lot to do with this access equity issue, what I call windows and mirrors. So there are you know, black young kids, basically they have windows that they're looking at and they're seeing other people doing all these things in the environmental field, um, in these really cool places, working in these places, but they're just windows. So they're looking, but then the white kids, they have mirrors. They're seeing themselves in these places. So they all, all of a sudden by them seeing images of themselves, they're realizing that they can be those different place, those different people. My favorite quote is by um, Sally Ride, who says, you have to see it to be it. And I really, I, I see that so much in this field when there are no images for these black and brown young people to see themselves in this environmental field. So all of these different things are contributing to this homogeneous field, which is even to this day, very white, male and wealthy. And then on the other side, there's diverse youth that are in so desperate need of opportunities and jobs. The unemployment rate, and you guys probably know a lot of this data, but has you know skyrocketed for black and brown youth. And you know, and needing not just jobs and opportunities, but there's this feeling of hopelessness 
you know, because they're trying to pursue different career pathways and they're not really coming to them. So at this time, I'm also looking at the current state of the environment and this existential threat that exists for all of us right now, this extreme weather that we're seeing, you know, and I think at this point, finally, everyone gets it that this stuff is real, it's real, it's factual, it exists. You know, we're seeing this, it's like a global emergency that we're experiencing right now, environmental degradation happening at unprecedented rates. Um, we're seeing flooding, droughts, fires, unprecedented fires in California, um, you know, in South America, mudslides, hurricanes, um, you know, there every year we're now experiencing things that were so much worse than the year before. And what is really, I mean, it's, it's disturbing across the board, but it's impacting community, communities of color at unprecedented rates because they're on the fringe. So they're often living in states in which, you know, one extra little thing sends them over the edge. So it's so many of these things are really um, disturbing. And, you know, when we think of the state of our, our planet, we re it's not necessarily a time to think about who is working on these things or who is in these spaces. I don't really think we have, we're not, we don't have the luxury right now to be focusing on that. So, you know, when I get into, and this is kind of this intersecting point is what I've been focused on, you know, for, for 10 years or so. Um, but when I look at why does it look like this, the field is something that Dr. Dorsetta Taylor, a sociologist, um, states in her Green 2.0 report, she suggests that there is this Green Insiders Club, you know, that there's insular recruiting that's happening where people are just hiring themselves over and over again. There's an implicit bias that's going on. Um, there's an unconscious bias. And you all know, I mean, a lot of people are talking about unconscious bias right now in light of what's happening um, with uh, Black Lives, Mat Lives Matter movement and so forth the preconceived notions that affects your judgment and decisions about a person or a group of people. But I have to tell you, I don't know how many of you out there are reading the book Cast by Isabel Wilkinson. Please write it down. Um, I will make sure that to put it in the, in the chat. Um, it's just kind of Isabel Wilkerson, great. A couple of people are reading it. It's a, a phenomenal book that's kind of looking at race, but also this hidden caste system that exists here in the US. But when I was reading it, I came across the best um, explanation or definition of um, unconscious bias. So I wanted to read that to you. Toward the end of the 20th century, social scientists found new ways to measure what had transformed from overt racism to a slow boil of unspoken antagonisms that social scientists called unconscious bias. This was not the cross-burning, epithet-spewing, biological racism of the pre-civil rights era, but rather discriminatory behaviors based on subconscious prejudgments by people who professed and believed in equality. By adulthood, researchers have found most Americans have been exposed to a culture with enough negative messages about African Americans and other marginalized groups that as much as 80 percent of white Americans hold unconscious bias against Black Americans, bias so automatic that it kicks in before a person can, pr can process it, according to the Harvard sociologist David R. Williams. So the fact that these responses contribute to the disparities in hiring and housing and education is, is really astounding to me. And it's crazy because it's, we're not even aware of it when it happens. It's something that, so with the saying of, you know, that white people in particular are benefiting from a racist system without even doing one racist act really is profound because it now, we now see people automatically say that they're not racist or when these th different things happen, they don't understand how these things are happening. Well, it's automatic. It's not. It's something that's so deeply ingrained because of the society that we live in. So that's another reason for us to bring this to the forefront and for us to be having the conversations like we're having right now. So the way forward, as I see, is intersectionality. 
Um, in the environmental field, I often speak of the importance of intersectionality and how we can't talk about engaging Black and Indigenous people of color in the environmental movement without understanding the centuries of oppression and institutional racism that exists um, and how it exists across every single industry and system and it has been impacted and it explains why in large part why black people and people of color are where they are now and i wanted to just share a few of those examples and how it plays out in the environmental field and perhaps how it could be happening in your field as well one of the things is volunteerism um, in a lot of environmental groups when I'm going and talking to them about this specific issue, it comes up, well, you know, we really wish that we can have more people of color to volunteer in the, this, whatever the, the, the job or the service project is. But, you know, what I often say is because of, again, of these hundreds of years of oppression, there is, it's, it's an un, unleveled playing field and that people often, people of color need to be paid for these experiences. We're not at the point yet. I mean, and I'm not speaking for all people of color, obviously, because there are different degrees and people are at different stages, but I'm just trying to help us all understand that there is a lens of intersectionality that we need to have when the numbers aren't where we think they should be in terms of people of color showing up for volunteerism. So perhaps there are different things that you can do or a different approach to engaging more people in, in volunteerism so that they can be a part of what you're trying to accomplish. And also diets and food, you know, with there's these health disparities. You know, as you all know, a lot of people of color are living in food deserts and, and food sovereignty is such a critical issue. So, you know, we have an urban youth core and that's something that we're focusing on is the importance of their diet and healthy foods. But one of the, and, and I also often talk to them about um, local food or organic food. And in some cases it's like, well, I'm getting what I can afford, you know? So I can, it's really hard to say, you know, don't do fast food when a family could feed themselves like on $5 as opposed to whole foods, which is more like $50 or even more. Um, and then the same thing with jobs, another example, um, in the environmental movement, sometimes the pay wage um, is not where it needs to be in order to be competitive. Um, in talking to a young lady that just took a job, um, and I won't mention the environmental organization, she mentioned that she had to have several smaller jobs in order to afford to do the job that they were offering and that she really wanted to do. So the desire to do this work is there, but the question is, can she afford it? Can people of color, given the history of what has happened to create this unlevel playing field, are they able to do this work in these fields without having that, um, the market rate? And then lastly, as an example, I would just say, um, we do a lot of work with outdoor retailers. So we're often talking about the gear. I know as you all, many of you, I'm hoping, are getting outdoors, especially with COVID. Um, you know, you're going on hikes and you're experiencing the outdoors, which is wonderful. Um, but in talking, Aaliyah, as you mentioned that um, discussion in North Carolina that I had, and in speaking to a lot of young people, they often speak of the gear that they need to do these experiences, that they cannot afford the gear. You know, so, I mean, I'm not trying to what we do at Green Youth Foundation is making sure they have access to that gear. So that's another example where it took us saying, well, I don't think we can't make this blanket statement that people of color are not interested in the environment without considering all of these other components. Um, so basically what I'm saying is that the environmental field is a microcosm of what is happening in society right now and what we've seen play out over the summer and actually still going on. Um, since the systemic oppression is per pervasive through all of these systems, as I stated, I have no doubt that there are elements of it in higher education and even in um, the gap year uh, community. So, you know, I mentioned that I am also an author. So just um, two years ago, I wrote a book with my brother actually, which was pretty cool 
called Engage, Connect, Protect, Empowering Diverse Youth as Environmental Leaders. And when asked why I wrote that book, it was mainly to debunk a lot of the stereotypes that exist out there. Um, but I also wanted to share my journey as an African-American entrepreneur and what it looks like to bring with my partner, bring a concept, an idea to fruition and all of the different pathways that it requires. But I also wanted to provide a resource guide and a database of organizations led by people of color. Um, but I've also listed schools. So one of the things that, and I think that might be useful for all of you is, you know, there's a list of HBCUs in that, in this book. There's also a list of uh, Hispanic serving organization, uh, Hispanic serving universities, as well as tribal colleges. Um, and there's also a resource for building partnerships, which is so critical. But basically it provides insight into the minds of these brilliant young people, which a lot of um, industries are now trying to figure out. Um, but I wanted to bring another, one of the few concepts to you from the book, Engage, Connect, Protect. One is um, a new paradigm for environmentalism. So I'm not sure how many of you have heard of Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She wrote, she, she actually wrote the book um, Americana. She's an awesome Nigerian author, um, but she has a TED talk. Her TED talk is fantastic. It's called Danger of a Single Story. And, you know, and basically you should write it down and you should watch it. But basically what she's saying is that Single stories, the danger of a single story is that they create stereotypes. And the problems with stereotypes is that they're not, they're, they're usually untrue. And oftentimes, if there is a semblance of truth to it, they're usually incomplete. So that one story is what becomes the only story. So I liken that to the environmental field because it's almost like there is a prototype for what an environmental environmentalist looks like, you know, what an environmentalist does or what their experience might be. Um, and I, what I'm saying is in order for us to bring in new people into each of these fields, gap year included, we have to really broaden our view of what that story should be and include other stories. Um, the other concept is activating a new generation. So I mentioned that I attended Spelman College, um, a historically black college, all women's. While I was there, Dr. Janetta B. Cole um, was our president who is so amazing. And she would always say, don't sit on the sidelines, be the change that you want to see in the world. So I have to say that that, that kind of resonated with me you know, while I was complaining about so few people of color in the environmental field. And that's kind of where Greening Youth Foundation, that was the impetus for starting Greening Youth Foundation. Greening Youth Foundation, as Aaliyah said, just to give you a little bit about it, um, our mission is engaging underrepresented youth and young adults while connecting them to the outdoors and careers in conservation. I would say over the past 15 years, I've been working to show how it's beneficial to engage young adults and communities of color in the environmental sector for several reasons. It removes blind spots. And again, this can apply across the board to various industries. It increases market exposure for an organization. It keeps your organization relevant to have diverse and young people engage and on part of your team. And it gives you access to brilliant, innovative, innovative minds. So through um, that mission, the way we've been doing that is through programming and I, I'll kind of just give you a few of the pros. We do an environmental and edu envir environmental and wellness program. Um, we have, uh, and as you guys mentioned that you spoke to an Americor the AmeriCorps president earlier, we have an urban youth corps program. So we're a part of that 21 CSC where we provide opportunities to young adults that maybe aren't going the college route and are in need of trades and skills and even soft skills so that they can be successful in different fields like solar technician, landscape management, 
and green, green infrastructure building and so forth. But then we have a youth conservation core where we provide um, paid internship opportunities to diverse young adults to work on public land. So we work with the National Park Service, Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife, and so forth. We could not do any of this without our partners. Partnerships are incredibly important. Um, but then we also do some international work for our international colleagues on the phone. We do work in uh, several African countries, working on reforestation, green infrastructure, solar, as well as um, environmental education programs. Um, last concept is changing the culture. And this one is, is pretty scary because I'm finding that culture is really rooted in any organization is rooted in, and grows from a lot of assumptions. In the environmental field, it's, I would say some of the assumptions are everyone wants to experience the outdoors the same way. And I'll pick the music and venue for our company retreat and all will like it. Or they all, everyone has the same backgrounds and connections to the outdoors. And lastly, people of color don't do outdoor things because they can't afford it. So what I'm saying is in order to change the culture in any field, we have to realize that we probably have more in common than we think. Um, but understanding that there are some assumptions that we have to relinquish, you know, because some of them might have some truths in them, but a lot of them do not. And that's what makes it really scary to kind of move on to embrace a new generation of folks that are wanting to work in this field. I also wanted to provide with you some practical tools for authentic diversity engagement. So one of the main things that I'll say is avoid performative acts. You know, I know that there was this tendency, um, you know, especially with the Black Lives Matter movement, everybody wanted to jump out and do something right away, you know, but what I'm saying is you need to take time and make sure it's well thought out and that your team is on board so that it's not just performative, so that in the future, this is something that you will be able to continue to do, not just at that moment. Um, early exposure is so critical in in this field, in your field as well, letting young people understand that this option exists of gap years, um, you know, and cast a, and this casts a wide net if you start early. And I already mentioned reaching out, be intentional about who you want to bring into your field, reaching out to HBCUs, tribal colleges and Hispanic serving institutions are a great way of introducing different communities to this work. Um, and as well as social influencers. I, I really have to say Malia Obama, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, was the first time that I had actually heard about gap year experiences. Um, but travels, travelers and bloggers are all great ways to share information about the opportunities that exist within your field. Um, so all of these things are important if you want to attract, engage, and retain talent. But the most significant is, genu is genuine outreach, is having somebody on your team that represents the groups or the demographics that you're wanting to engage. Um, I can't say underscore that enough. It's so important when you, and I, just a quick antidote, and I know that I'm getting close to time, but I would, if, I were, if I were showing slides, I'd much rather you guys be watching this, the graphic, but I would be showing the designer Gucci, I don't know how many of you remembered, they had, they committed a faux pas and they had like a, a sweater that pulled up and it, it looked like blackface, um, and which was, you know, immediately everyone, you know, understandably had an issue with it. And to me, I just know that there was nobody black on their design team, you know, so they clearly had blind spots. And if there had been someone on their design team, I'm sure they would have said, not a good idea. Let's go back to the drawing board. So it's really important to have those folks as part of your team because you want to make sure all of those voices are being represented. So my fear is that in, in a few months, will things just go back to white reality where privilege, access, and opportunity is abundant? You know, and I'm really praying that we're we're going to see some of this change that we're all talking about. 
because we really need substantive change, not equality in the abstract. One of my mentors says that you can't prob you can't solve systemic problems with ad hoc solutions. And last, I want to just say that here are examples of when you know that you are, when there is growth happening. I identify how I may unknowingly benefit from racism. I promote and advocate for policies and leaders that promote DEI. I sit with my discomfort. I yield positions of power to those otherwise marginalized. I surround myself with others who don't, who think and look differently than me. And then for our opportunities of now, as I mentioned with Dr. Wangari Mathai, there's so many opportunities right now. There's opportunities to advance equitable practices and policies and culture in this field and expand your references to diversity and equity include communities in these efforts. Gap Year Association could serve as an equity influencer in the field. You have the opportunity to prioritize participation of diverse constituencies in decision-making processes. And you have the opportunity to incorporate equity lens to performance management and compensation plan. So like I mentioned, when Malia Obama back in, I guess, what was that, 2016, 2017, announced that she was taking this gap year, I kind of felt a little weird about it, I have to admit. I was like, you have all of this opportunity and you're taking a gap year? And I realized that I had to, and I had to think about why I was having that reaction. And I think after I thought about it, and especially after you all reached out to me to deliver this address, a lot of it had to do with, as a Black person, understanding that our ancestors did so much to make sure we had access to education, access to reading, you know, that the fact that she's in this position and is saying, I'm having, a, I'm taking a gap year, felt really entitled and privileged to me. Um, and then I did this informal survey recently, and it was kind of the same thing amongst a lot of my colleagues who are African American and uh, Latino and so forth. But what I'm saying is that there's just a lack of information in our communities about gap years. And of course, gap year is now no longer a, ne a luxury, but a necessity. I have a son who's 18, who went to African Leadership Academy, and they actually did mention the gap year opportunity to him. But in my mind, in my husband and I's mind, we still kind of went, of course you're not doing the gap year. You're gonna go off to college. Now, guess what? He's saying, I may need to take a gap year. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, I need you all to seize the opportunity of now. This is your moment. I think with COVID, it's kind of upended everything. There is no sense of normalcy now. And a lot of people, as Luke mentioned in his, his stat, stats and the reports, a lot of people are looking for time to kind of step back and assess what they want to do, particularly young people. So I know that young people of color are needing you now than ever. So what I'd like to say is seize the opportunity of now and broaden your reach. So I'd like to, to end with a quote, an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Thank you all so much for inviting me today. Awesome. Very well done, Angelo. Thank you so very much. Um, um, yeah, claps on the side. Um, um, onto, that was beautiful. Marsha, can I ask you to um, share your screen and, and let's get um, um, everyone to, to see the, the awesome work that you've been creating. Um, I think we had some people who missed yeah, it along the way. Um, um, and Angela, we have, we have about five or so minutes if we have some questions that wanna come in. Um, um, I, I love your call to action in terms of being an equity influencer. Um, and you're right, we have, we have the pulpit, we have the microphone, we have the attention. 
and so um, um, you know, I think we've been spinning our wheels very tightly and very fast internally, and and forgetting the power of our of our opportunity in some ways right now. And so, um, um, well done, good call. Yeah, yeah. Um, if people have any questions, uh, now would be a great time to to chat them in on the window. Um, otherwise. Um, we have about seven minutes until we break, so um, 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 feel free to chat them in. Um, otherwise, you, you, I can continue to talk, but I don't know that anyone wants to hear my voice anymore. Um, um, but Anjali, uh, um, um, I mean, uh, there, there's so many things that, that you brought up in the midst of your conversation, um, um, sort of of your, of your, your, your keynote. Um, it went very well. Um, I definitely have a few notes in terms of TED Talks and that cast book. I, I've heard about it, but I haven't uh, admittedly gone out to buy it yet. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, get ready. I mean, it, it's pretty, <clears throat> it's very poignant, and um, but it's stuff that we need to read about. It needs, we, I think that that, you know, again, when I'm talking about this lens of understanding how we move forward, I think we have to be informed of our past, no matter how good, bad, or ugly it is. And I think that that is something that Isabel Wilkerson does in that book is just informs of all of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and I, you know the the how you also open the conversation. Um, I, sort of one of it's it's funny because you I heard you say something that I say in a different way, which is um, um, one of mankind's greatest limitations is we can only dream as big as we've seen, and so until we can find a way to see ourselves into whatever it is might be. Um, black and brown people out in the wilderness. Um, um, and I, I think it's interesting because it feels somewhat reductive to call it a marketing challenge, but I know that that's, that's still so present, right? I mean- I know, I know it's ridiculous that that is still a thing, but it really is. I mean, it, it's, um, I mean, we've made the suggestions and I think that, and I, in all fairness, some of these, some of our partners like the North Face and so forth, they are making improvements in their, in the Patagonia there, we're seeing that change, but it's amazing the direct correlation, you know, of how, you know, communities. And I actually, one question I want to ask you, Ethan, was about are, when you all are going and doing your college um, awareness fairs and so forth, are you going to HBCUs? Not, no, no, we have not been. So to be honest, the only <laughs> conversation I've had any luck with was when I was in DC, um, at, at the press club um, when they were releasing the Institute for International Education's sort of data. And there was some phenomenal, uh, Howard was there, um, um, Xavier was there, and I made some great contacts. And there's some work, there's, there's lots of work ahead for us in, in networking with uh, HBCUs. And quite frankly, it, it is one area where, you know, Trump gave them 10 years of funding. And hopefully that, that like that is one area where, where Trump did a great thing. And um, yeah, um, that is one area. And I, I think that um, yes. I, I, and let's definitely speak. Why are you laughing? Oh, it's it's one area. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 right. <laughs> but let me help you with that. I mean, you you definitely have to. My son is a senior at Howard University, and I think that the opportunity that presents with a gap year is something that these students definitely need exposure to. But I think that they're just not aware of it and they're not viewing it as something that they could partake in. Perhaps that's something for some other group of people. So as we did with the environmental sector by bringing it to centering it for them and saying, no, this isn't for other people. This isn't just for white people. Like I need, we need to do that for gap years as well because I think we, all of these young people need this exposure. It's definitely necessary. And like I said, and I see it as a necessity in light of what's happening with uh, COVID right now. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so funny. Like when, when um, Malia Obama announced uh, on one front sort of, we have two competing challenges. One is that gap years cost a lot of money. They're only for the well-to-do. It's not true, but that's a, that's a story. Another is that you're not, it's for those who aren't ready for college, right? Sort of, you know, academic atrophy, blah, blah, blah. And it was interesting because when Malia announced she was thinking a gap year on one front, it was like, well, if it's good enough for the president's daughter, it's good enough for everybody. So the academic atrophy sort of like putative summer school, that, that conversation has, has sort of reduced a lot. Unfortunately, it also doubled down on the power of privilege um, um, yeah. just for the, the affluence and the position that, that she was able to, to avail herself of. Um, um, and mind you, you know, it's just one piece of a large part of work that we have ahead of ourselves to, to um, continue to cultivate uh, more diversity in our field and 
Um, I really like your call to power of just saying like, let's like identify the person who's going to represent them and make sure you include them in the call at every step from start to, from start to finish. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Andrew, we're, we're just at about the, the end of the time. Um, I've got a couple sort of like one final slide to offer and some closing remarks, but um, um, anything you'd like to say uh, to, to sing your part out? Thank you. No, I would just, I would just like to thank you all for having um, the, <clears throat> the awareness to say you're working on this issue as I read, as I saw in the presentation by Luke. Um, but understanding that you need to, go, and then people are saying in the chat that there's still work, there's a lot of work to be done, you know, and, and, and what I would say is to encourage you not to, to give up, not to, you know, when things perhaps don't work out perfectly with that first contact at an HBCU or wherever, keep at it and finding someone, so finding champions within those different entities to move your message forward, because believe me when I tell you it's super necessary in communities of color. So I applaud you all for the work and just know that you got to roll up your sleeves because you got a lot of work to do. <laughs> well done, well done. I couldn't have said it better, Angela. Thank you. I'm profoundly grateful, as is everyone on this call, no doubt. Um, um, and, and doubly so for, um, so Anjali, one of, one of the closing comments I'm going to offer um, um, is that Anjali is participating in a, in a session right after this on sustainability. So um, um, if you want more more of the medicine of Angelou, <laughs> the good vibes that she offers, um, um, stay tuned to that conference session next. Um, Marsha, anything that you'd like to say about your artwork before I take over the slide? I, I did make my way back to you. Uh, just, it was such a pleasure listening and um, I will, I'm going to add a few more of the ideas and thoughts that Angelou shared and then this will be available I think through um, the Unleash website and um, just encourage you all, it's, it, it can often be, the goal is to sort of provide you a, a synthesized version of, of all of the wonderful insights and ideas that um, Angelou shared and so this can be a touch point to come back to or to share on social media with others if you want to get the word out there so thank you. Brilliant. Marcia this is beautiful and it's been wonderful to watch this come together. Um, thank you for this contribution. Yeah my pleasure. Thank you Marcia it's awesome. Yeah. Um, all right, so I'm going to um, real quickly take over uh, for my closing remarks um, and then um, remember to find your next conference session back in the Unleash software. So first of all, massive gratitude to uh, Angelou, her team from the Greening Youth Foundation that brought this all together. Um, thanks to Julia and to Aaliyah to, for bringing Angelou to our attention and um, um, allowing us to recruit such an awesome ambassador. Um, to everybody on the panel, thank you. Um, and um, um, a reminder, we've got at the end of the day, a membership meeting, um, awards are tomorrow, and we've got a gappy hour at the end of each day. Uh, bring your own, whatever you want. Um, it doesn't have to have alcohol. Um, it can be a, a spin drift or a water. Um, and thank you for all that you uh, bring to this table and to this field, everybody. Um, I look forward to seeing you in um, conference sessions throughout the rest of the, uh, the, the next few days. If you have any questions or challenges, conferences at gapyearassociation.org or support at unleash.com. Thank you very much. I'll see you soon. <laughs>